Uh, Rushal is a senior infrastructure consultant, originally turned from a developer, software developer to an infrastructure consultant. And he will walk us through how to attack your own system and how to learn from that. So Rushal, please go ahead. It's your stage. Looking forward. So like Marion said, I'm an info consultant based in the UK. And today I'll be talking about using simulations to tackle cyber attacks. Um, and what do I mean by cyber attacks uh, or, or simulations rather? Um, so I was lucky enough last year to be on a particular project that was uh, commissioned by a public sector client within the UK. And what they were essentially worried about was, uh, or what they were thinking about rather, was how do we make sure that our data doesn't fall into the hands of highly capable actors? Um, and how do we protect our, our cloud systems from being compromised by these, these actors? And the focus of this particular exercise was, uh, was, is there a way of actually attacking our continuous delivery security controls? There's a blog post by the National Cyber Security Center uh, called Defending Software Build Pipelines from Malicious Attack. And in there, there's a particular quote that, uh, by the author, Jamie H, that goes, uh, your build pipeline is one of the foundations of your system security. So give it the attention it deserves. And this is essentially what we were trying to do. Um, but in this particular exercise, uh, we had these, these multiple teams. And there's this idea of a red team and a blue team. And these terms are brought back from the military, especially the Cold War, uh, where the blue team will play the defenders and the red team will play the attackers. And you would go ahead and simulate different war scenarios to figure out how to best protect your country, best protect an area. Uh, and, and this idea sort of transcended into cybersecurity where you have a blue team and a red team. So for our simulation, we also followed this same pattern. Uh, we had a blue team, which represented a typical, but good agency team, digital team. And what they were trying to do was build out a public cloud application. We also had a red team and the red team's job was to essentially validate our assumptions and learn how our security controls could potentially be defeated. We actually have also had a third team and this consisted of our stakeholders. Uh, and this just uh, included any of our interested public sector clients uh, subject matter experts and any other interested parties. These particular um, people, these stakeholders would be the ones who would consume our learnings and, and they would be the ones that would share it with a wider audience as well as uh, their own local digital teams. So like I mentioned before, the purpose of this particular exercise was to research the security boundaries of a public sector uh, client and the system that they had in the cloud. And for this to happen, we would need to base our system on the best practices. Uh, this included uh, National Cybersecurity Center's uh, best, pra best practices. Uh, and what we were trying to learn is, or answer is, how practical are these patterns? But why the cloud and to, understand this, we have to go back around 10 years. So around 10 years ago, uh, we had a policy introduced by the government. And this was the cloud first policy, uh, as you can see in the screenshot on the right. And this particular policy has led to more public sector applications, uh, public sector applications and services being deployed to the public cloud. These particular departments hope to realize both, you know, the, the significant security, uh, the cost, the availability benefits, uh, and also accelerate that shift away from, from legacy technology. 
Uh, and this is something that's true across the board with enterprises uh, in all sorts of different sectors. So it wasn't just limited to our public sector clients, but it was something that we were seeing across the board. And as more and more uh, of these enterprises and these businesses have uh, are adopting the cloud, it becomes even more important to understand what are the limits afforded by our cloud security controls. Uh, so we have a bunch of new technical and management paradigms that are being brought in, uh, which will allow us to promote software changes and features into production uh, super, super quick. And this could be the, using things such as a continuous delivery pipeline or infrastructure as code. Finally, and this is sort of specific to the public sector, but a lot of the information that is created or processed by them is classified as official. Um, what do I mean by official? By official, I mean it has damaging consequences if this is not kept secure, but the data itself is not subject to a heightened threat profile. So what we were, what the hypo uh, hypothesis that we had for this particular experiment was that the security concerns for official information and services would be well met on the condition that the controls that we put in place were implemented com uh, competently and that um, we also wanted to make sure that this exercise would support that. However, we also wanted to go a little bit further and test the robustness of such an approach to a heightened threat profile. Uh, and this would leave, uh, lead us to some assumptions about the attackers and the kind of resources that they may have, as well as elevated capabilities. And this would be consistent with a heightened threat, uh, heightened threat profile. So using some of the security controls we select, we could find out if our cloud pipeline could be made more robust uh, and whether it is, is penetrable by an attacker of this particular nature. Now, there are a ton of threats uh, in a system and we could spend forever trying to cover all of them. So it sort of made sense for us to have some principles in place. And this will help us focus on some scenarios that would give us some valuable insight. For the project in general, we were looking to find or, or discover scenarios that would teach us something new uh, about a security control and how it, it could possibly be speeded. The second principle that we were looking at was uh, about implementing the platform itself. So for us to research known security uh, boundaries, we our blue team would need to implement a test platform. And again, this will be based on published best practices, such as those published by the NCSC, the National Cyber Security Center, as well as the AWS Well Architected Framework. Finally, our last principle was focused on communicating our learnings. Uh, our key audience for our audience, uh, for our learnings was the public sector client who would then want to empower their local technology team to deliver secure systems. And um, this could be through code snippets or uh, a write-up of our particular technology stack. To help us narrow down some of the areas to focus on, we end up putting this into three phases. Our first phase, uh, initiate, was to figure out the scope and plan out different elements of this particular exercise. Our second phase, the explore and build uh, phase, would include some evaluation of the public cloud options. Um, we would start building the foundation and the configuration of the public cloud infrastructure, the delivery pipeline, as well as the service environment. And finally, the third phase. This would include the attacking, the learning, and the refining of different scenarios. Uh, and this would allow us to address those different scenarios that we came up with. This phase definitely involved the part where the red team would try and break the blue team's infrastructure and pipeline, uh, and also the blue team's continuous uh, efforts to respond to these attacks by putting in uh, you know, things that would actually defend against it. Now, it's, it's super hard to try and uh, do this all from scratch, so we decided to make some personas. Um, and this would be something that a typical public sector client team may possibly look like. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our fictional UK public client, the Creative Licensing Agency. Now, the Creative Licensing Agency is an agency that administer, administers creative licenses 
to creators of all types. And this particular agency would be building its public cloud architecture for the very first time. Like most public sector clients, it would need a web presence to interact with its citizens and customers. And the content of this functionality of this web application would be controlled by uh, the internal teams. The development teams and the platform teams would be quite small compared to the engineering teams that you might find in large technology firms. And the platforms provisioned uh, would be would need to be managed cost effectively in the long term. This made the uh, public cloud a good fit with all of these particular requirements. For the purpose of this exercise, we also determined that there will be a small team of platform engineers who are familiar with software as a service and infrastructure as a service provisioning, and they would be responsible for maintaining the creative license, license uh, agency's underlying public cloud infrastructure. There would also be a team of web engineers, and these engineers would be familiar with web technologies, and they would be respons responsible for coding and maintaining the web presence. So like I said before, this, these personas helped us uh, define what teams we'll be working with, but they also helped us make some statements about the authorization boundaries, uh, the segment, uh, segregation of responsibilities, as well as these privilege and some operational processes. The red team, on the other hand, uh, would be responsible for undermining and breaking the environments built by the blue team. And this would be composed of cybersecurity experts and penetration testers. And they will be working under guidance from the uh, stakeholders that I mentioned before. Uh, for the purpose of this exercise, we determined that the attackers that were interested in undermining the delivery pipeline and the cloud infrastructure should possess the type of capabilities associated with a heightened threat profile. Um, so although a heightened threat profile isn't necessarily associated with the official information and services, which is what makes up the majority of data handled by a public sector client, the project team wanted to to test the risk boundaries in this particular exercise. So for the red team, we can assume they have some significant technical skill and that they have an elevated threat capability. Uh, and this is in line with an attacker that is working part uh, as part of a well-resourced uh, offensive operations team and that a team that has access to extensive technical experience and education. Uh, we also wanted to examine scenarios where earlier access, persistence, and influence tactics provide a launch pad for an onward exploitation. So this would lead us to uh, explore the following tactics. The ability to take control of a software development workstation. So we can assume that and red team could achieve this by the result of spear phishing campaigns or using a drive-by download or using a browser exploitation. Uh, complete access to source code. So we can assume that the red team has spent you know, months um, having a successful and you know, exploring uh, and discovery by the, the, the attacker themselves. Uh, and finally, we have the, the uh, influence, um, the, the ability to influence developers by taking malicious actions, and whether that's by coercion or more likely taking control of developer accounts and identities within that delivery infrastructure. Great. So we've got our, our personas set in place. We know who they are. Let's get on to the initiation of building our cloud infrastructure. So I mentioned before, the subject matter is super large and there are so many trade-offs to, to navigate, especially since our resources were limited. Uh, the teams themselves only had a, a size of three to five people per team. So there, um, and the timeline of this was across four or five months. 
which meant that there was a lot to do and not a lot of people to do it. A lot of this thinking also mirrors some of the constraints that might present themselves in a digital, te a digital team in government. And there were also competing needs that, need, that teams needed to find the right trade-offs between. With this particular exercise, security is, is front and center in our simulation. But for a lot of teams out there, service delivery is, tends to be the primary driver. And this also kind of needed to be reflected in how we structured the exercise. I'm gonna go quickly through, through the different uh, sliders that we have. Um, but for the first one, we would adopt so software as a service um, at, at the beginning, just because it would be quicker to build and operate rather than deploying and running components from scratch. We'll see later on how this shifts towards the left and we'll see how the strategy of adopting a software as a service uh, would compare uh, to having our own um, delivery service and what it would, what the payoff of that would be. At the beginning, we would build a simple static workload, but the goal in the end is to make sure that the red team have something to target. So we'll move towards a more dynamic system later on, but to get ourselves off the ground, we would need to make sure we have a simple static workload. A lot of cloud systems, modern cloud systems, they're a mixture of infra code and application code. And we didn't wanna just focus on the continuous delivery pipelines themselves. Um, and just end up going the, uh, the route of ignoring that application stack. So this slide is slightly uh, on the right of the center, but there is a little bit of focus on the application as well. Um, and finally, we also wanted to uh, focus on preventive controls rather than detection. And this is mostly because we didn't have a security operations center uh, analyst or anyone to to focus on threat hunting. So we would need to focus on preventive controls more so than detection. And finally, although it's sort of relevant, um, all of the development and management of our cloud system occurred from endpoint uh, devices, such as our laptops. And a attacker can access this device, um, who, can uh, who can access this device, would inherit the permissions of a developer or an administrator. Um, we took the endpoint security out of scope for this particular exercise and made the assumption that if an attacker has, uh, has managed to attack the developer, then it's just better off just giving them the credentials and seeing what they could do with that. Like I mentioned before, we would focus on having a static workload and this would be our initial architecture. Our repositories were hosted on GitHub and the infrastructure itself was built using AWS services where possible. Uh, so the reason behind this is the fact that this is a very commonly adapted, uh, adopted solution. So a lot of repositories are on GitHub, a lot of infrastructures built on AWS, uh, which means that it could be applied across a wide range of use cases. We would then use the uh, different types of guidances to shape our approach and ensure it, it reflected a public sector, uh, public cloud implementation. One of these uh, guidelines or some of these guidelines were things such as the NCSC cloud security principles. And this would be like our top level control framework. And the reason behind this is because this is the default security guidance that is expected of a public sector team that is adopting a uh, public cloud, and they will refer to this. Since this exercise was directed around the guidance around governments and, and ongoing risk management, uh, we, we sort of left that sort of, we left that out. The second piece of guidance that we took a look at was the NCSC uh, Secure Depo Development and Deployment Guidance. And this was adopted primarily because building a secure cloud delivery environment uh, is what we were focusing on. Uh, we also adopted the AWS well-architected standards um, since this was our primary cloud vendor uh, 
And we made some simplifications to the network um, because of the scope of the exercise, but these we found didn't have that much of an impact on the security of the simulation. The last one I wanna call out is the AWS UK official reference deployment template. And whilst this was valuable, the AWS service that we chose to adopt, such as PPC endpoints, uh, were considerably newer than those that were targeted in that particular resource. Um, and also the AWS UK official reference deployment uh, was written in cloud formation. And we decided to go with an alternative configuration management engine with Terraform. So having done all of that, we had laid some of the foundation of what we could potentially build. And like I mentioned before, we were hosting our repositories on GitHub. Uh, with GitHub, you have the possibility of using GitHub Actions as their software as a service. And we decided to take that up. So our pipeline initially would be GitHub Actions. We also implemented AWS Control Tower or adopted it and made use of it in multiple ways. Um, something that came out of the box with Control Tower was uh, AWS single sign-on. And this allowed us to provide users with access to all of their assigned accounts and applications from a single user portal. One of the huge, huge benefits of this are, is that users are issued with temporary credentials uh, in each session. And this reduces the risk of human error. It reduces the potential attack surface, uh, especially rather than having multiple IAM users or uh, having static credentials stored in uh, on a file. We also enabled uh, AWS Guard Duty in all of our regions. Um, and we also complemented this by having uh, service control policies, SCPs. And one of the SCPs that you see on the right-hand side, the screenshot is denying an IAM user from logging in to the console. And this was done to complement the fact that we were using AWS single sign-on. There were other SCPs that we created, uh, such as um, denying access to root in the child accounts um, and disabling all the regions that were not being used, such as um, you know, US East 2 or something like that. Instead, we would only enable the region in London and in Ireland. One of the things we found was that some of the AWS services didn't really fit together that well. Um, and as teams sort of, our team sort of had to work manually to integrate some of these services and modules. And by doing that, there's a little bit of potential to create some vulnerabilities between those services. The other thing we found was using Terraform modules uh, allowed our team to get up and running quickly. But for example, one of the modules, the VPC module, hadn't uh, it, it might not leverage some of the recent AWS offerings, uh, such as AWS Network Firewall, and needed a little bit of modification to the actual VPC Terraform module. So what did the red team find? Um, so with this simple setup, the red team actually managed to manipulate GitHub Actions um, to be able to actually extract the secrets available through the pipeline. And this actually included stealing some AWS access keys. Uh, the way they were able to do this was by modifying the pipeline code uh, to output any secrets in base64 and then decode that in the once they had the log output. It was super interesting to see that. Um, but at this point in time, we'd also actually given them access to push straight to the, the repository and may be prevented by using uh, PRs or, or code reviews. So that was our first scenario. And we would now move on to exploring and build. Um, and again, this would be where our trade trade-offs sort of shift a little bit to the left. Uh, so having the red team exploit our credentials through GitHub Actions meant that we could find a gap between GitHub and AWS. And this would be a soft spot. By that, I mean the AWS account would then end up being a good boundary for us to try and protect. We would 
want to sort of build our own particular pipeline for this um, and we would go ahead and build a uh, and we want to have some more control within our pipeline um, than what we could do within GitHub Actions alone. So we would go and go on to leverage AWS code pipeline within the AWS account for a more constrained pipeline, but still make use of GitHub Actions for anything before that. We also want a more realistic and dynamic system, uh, which has some data available. And this would give some, uh, the red team to uh, something to target. And finally, we would want to um, have some applications loaded, which has some sort of back end and front end. And for this, we went with ECS. However, it was uh, we had the choice between a Lambda architecture or a Kubernetes service. Uh, Kubernetes would be a bit too complex at this point in time where we had a small team um, and a Lambda architecture took away some of the attack surface from Docker and a long running ser service. And we wanted to explore that. Um, all of these are, are very common architectural choices. And uh, we, we decided to go with ECS just because it would give us a little bit more of an attack surface and generate a few more learnings. So, our architecture ended up looking a little bit like this uh, once we followed through with some of the, the uh, decisions. We added this idea of a trusted pipeline that would allow us to give us some security control, but still allow the development team to log in and uh, to the AWS environment in order to get some feedback and output from their build. This helps check some of the boxes from the NCSC secure the build and deployment pipeline guidelines, such as ensuring that the deployment pipelines cannot be bypassed or reordered. And we could either achieve this architecturally or by carrying out cryptographic signing and verification at each stage. The other checkbox is to avoid self-policing. And um, by that, I mean the pipeline should enforce rules that define whether the code is accepted or rejected by the deployment. Every week, we would have an in-depth collaborative workshop, which would look into some of the granular technical uh, threat model of our architecture. And this was super useful to try and find out what other scenarios we could generate for the, the red team to attack. Um, this was an iterative process and it would help us uh, with the ultimate aim of finding out how the red team could try and extract the content out of the RDS database. Um, we also identified having a complete takeover of the AWS structure as a goal for the red team and assumed that the red team would be able to evade detection, at least at first. So we can break this down into to two steps, right? Um, and categorize it according to a attacker workflow. So the first one would be the initial access. Uh, and these are strategies that are leveraged by the red team to try and get a foothold into the system so that they could be more efficient and e effectively escalate privilege into the data that they're more interested in. The other, strat uh, the other um, step would be onward exploitation. And these are subsequent steps that are taken to move laterally and escalate privilege into parts of, system, or parts of the system that contain sensitive information and services and then extract them. Um, so one of the things that we learned from this was we introduced uh, policies as code uh, and we applied this within our trusted pipeline to help us detect any misconfiguration in our Terraform files. Uh, these were rules that governed the behavior of a software service and allowed decoupling of the uh, policies and the software service. Um, we also allowed the policies to be updated independently from the software, uh, which meant that it was decoupled. And the rules themselves were written in Rego, uh, which had a very interesting learning curve. And they use open policy agent as the policy engine. Uh, engine. Um, the trusted pipelines that we brought in uh, allowed us to perform additional checks on all code, and it helped reduce the potential blast radius of malicious code entering the primary pipeline. Our trusted pipeline had conf tests, uh, semgrep, tfsec, and checkoff scans uh, running in within that pipeline. We managed to catch a lot of suspicious code 
code, but they, it was not foolproof and needed to be supported by additional capabilities and policies. Finally, phase three, attack, learn, and refine. So for this, we have three scenarios that we wanna talk about. And the first one I wanna talk about is what happens if Blast Radius gets through the application uh, into the app web application? What is, the, what is the Blast Radius? So for this, we allowed the red team to push any code they wanted with no controls in place. And what they did was add an endpoint. And this dumped all of our, our data as JSON. And even if the application had authentication, it was super simple to add code that would bypass it. And this wasn't caught by any of our technical controls in the pipeline. We also found out that the, the um, red team attempted to deploy a bind web shell to try and attempt to get command and control from within our production uh, VPC. Uh, they weren't able to get any traffic out of the network, but for anyone who's interested in uh, buying web shells, essentially um, a shell is a program that interprets our commands and gives those written commands to the operating system. It essentially acts like an interface between the user and the operating system. Um, and an example of this would be like your terminal. Now, a bind shell is a sort of setup where the remote consoles are established with computers over a network. And here you can see our backend API uh, service being changed. And what will happen is an attacker would be able to connect to the target computer and execute commands within the target computer. So the red team attempted to do that and they were not successful uh, or as successful as they like to be. Uh, and this was because our policies as code pipeline managed to catch it using SEMGREP. However, the red team went one step further and changed their Java code to use reflection. And that managed to bypass the SEMGREP rules. Uh, we also saw some other scenarios. Um, so the next scenario is what happens if bad Terraform gets through the pipeline? So assume that the bad Terraform gets through the pipeline and is deployed. What is the blast radius? So here we have um, a, some Terraform and essentially it's using the external provider to execute a shell command. And what this command will do is it will uh, access the ECS metadata service and ask for the access keys and extract the access keys. So this is what happens when this gets executed. We find that here we're running AWS STS, STS get caller identity. And you can see that we are uh, the pipeline. And since pipelines tend to have uh, elevated privileges to allow them to do what they need to do, this is bad, right? Um, but what we were able to do after that, after the red team had managed to push this code through is write a policy to try and defend against this. Um, so it, policies as code ends up being a cat and mouse game where the blue team responded to the red team and this particular uh, policy would prevent any provider from being used unless it was AWS or random. The final scenario I wanna talk about is what happens if we have a malicious developer? Would, what, is, what would the blast radio be if that developer was an evil developer? And this was a fun one to think about because of the fact that you got to think about your evil self and what particular controls were effective. Um, and what we found was that the evil developer could essentially uh, commit a file that was written in JSON and it would bypass all of our, our rules. And here we can see this actually being executed um, where it outputted the uh, AWS access key and the secret key. So this is all well and good, but a terraform.json file would be pretty suspicious if you have a pull request or a code review. Um, so how do we make that exploit look a little bit uh, more stealthy? And so we have this terraform resource here, and this is a standard terraform resource. 
what it would do is essentially set the string to be a particular password uh, based on the random provider. And this would set the set for the database password, for example, an RDS instance. And here we have a, uh, the same resource. But what we've done is we've put some quotes around it. And this would set it to a known value uh, as a literal string. And if the attacker can interact with the affected service, for example, RDS, uh, they might be able to log in and extract confidential data. What about overriding application pages? Uh, so here we have a, a listener rule and we are changing the message body to be a single file. Um, and when someone was to sign up on this particular form, it would, they would be sent to the attacker server. However, this involves two particular files being changed and two commits um, or one commit. And it could be noticed quite easily. We could try and uh, make this exploit a little bit smaller by using a, add, uh, a HTTP provider. But once again, this particular provider would be blocked by uh, uh, the rule. So the footprint could be decreased if it's not for the security controls in place. So in conclusion, uh, there were a bunch of security controls that we put in place. And we, uh, the first one I wanna talk about is identity and access management. Uh, and this referred to the controls around authentication and authorization of the developers and administrators with access to the system. Um, and for this, we end up using AWS SSO as our primary driver of, of, uh, uh, of production and using least privilege to protect that. The second one was the account structure in SCP and this, this and service control policies. And this referred to the segmentation of workloads uh, to help prevent the escalation of privilege into our crucial components, such as the databases or the um, the cloud admin interfaces. The third security control that we talked about was policy as code and pipeline tests. And this just referred to additional testing that was focused on security. Additional tests and constraints are, that are added to the delivery pipeline, which focus on our infrastructure activities, uh, adds an additional constraint and the ability to detect. Um, the fourth one is detection response and threat hunting. Um, so we didn't really talk about this in too much detail, but we talked a little bit about AWS Guard Duty, which did a lot of our detection for us. Uh, this exercise could definitely be repeated with, um, with a dedicated threat hunting team. Um, for the most part, we let uh, AWS Guard Duty pick up on any particular threats that it could find. And um, finally, the last one is two pairs of eyes and code review. And this referred to the human processes that are associated with the technical controls to prevent activities. However, it's worth noting that this is not infallible. You know, um, if someone this relies on people being competent, uh, not being on a Friday afternoon where they might be kind of sleepy or perhaps even um, having you know, not knowing that this change, if it's part of a, a much bigger change and some change slipping through. Um, and then one thing I mentioned briefly was the control and hardening of the endpoints. And this was, and due to the constraints, it was sort of placed out of, uh, out of scope. But it's important to also mention the endpoint security as well as getting the assurances of security uh, of underlying services provided by a cloud provider. And with that, I just want to give a quick shout out to our client uh, and my fellow red team and blue team members. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. That was really interesting. Um, so we have uh, one question already um, with regard to your, uh, your uh, talk. Um, can you share your best practices you just mentioned, for example, disabling root access for IAM users. I would love to run those um, with our security and platform teams. 
Yeah, so we did this by enabling um, service control policies. Um, and obviously there are other service control policies that you could put in place. Um, uh, we can actually find the code snippets that we did for this uh, on GitHub. Um, it's under github.com forward slash tin tulip, uh, tin like the metal and tulip like the uh, flower. And what we, um, the reason we, we actually found this was uh, part of the NCSC blog posts and, and guidance within that. So a lot of those guidances could be found in there. Okay, thank you. Um, which scenario did you like most or what was the most fun or what from which scenario did you learn the most? Um, so I think the most fun one was when we got to think about ourselves as evil developers. Like uh, if we decided to go bad, at any point in time, um, how do we bypass our own controls? I think that was the most fun to think about. Um, there are tons of places, especially if you're in an elevated position uh, within the platform team. Um, and if, if companies end up having this idea of uh, a single platform team, um, because, you know, Building a platform requires a lot of investment and, and resources to try and find that, that particular configuration. And with a shared platform team providing that principle uh, allows you to have the economies of scale, but it also provides that single high value target. So having a team that, it, that could potentially be turned evil or even be offered money from a potential attacker to, to, to do malicious things, it's good to know whether those activities would um, allow you to bypass any security controls you put in place. Okay, thank you. Um, have you applied uh, some of the learnings already on other projects and how did you do that? Uh, yeah, so there were a couple of projects that I've been on since, um, one of which ended up being about the secure supply chain and that was a a very trending topic, uh, at least in the last two years, um, and using the software bill of materials. So there were a few things I didn't mention in this talk because we were limited for time, but mm -hmm. we ended up using Artifactory as a uh, way of making sure that our secure supply chain was secure and producing these software bill of materials. And that was something that we took to another client. Um, and there is another one that I'm on right now where we're doing something very similar with our pipeline. Um, and yeah, there is a uh, more generic question um, whether ThoughtWorks have regularly talk about cybersecurity uh, throughout the year. Additional, is there a specialized section at ThoughtWorks who support projects uh, emphasizing uh, cybersecurity? Yes, we have, I will collect some information about that later on, uh, but maybe you can add also something. Um... Um, so I'm not sure about uh, external talks that we have within uh, ThoughtWorks, but I know internally we tend to, at least in the UK, we have uh, a monthly meeting, which is like a round table. Um, I can't remember what the actual calendar event itself is called, but essentially every month, um, a group of the security champions on a bunch of different clients will get together talk about what sort of things they're going through, what ideas they're thinking of implementing and uh, issues that they might be thinking about um, with uh, our client security. Yeah, and I also know that we have our, our colleagues in India um, regularly host InfoSec um, talks. As I said, I will try to collect this information later on. Um, then a last one, did enabling the strict security policies affect in any way the development teams in their ability to create new uh, deployments and to be more self-sufficient without root access? If yes, what was the solution? Uh, kind of, yes. Um, in terms of we, we try to make the developer team a lot more self-sufficient. Um, it's also worth pointing out in this particular case, uh, the development team and the platform team were both controlled by the blue team members. So it was harder to say on this particular exercise and simulation, what the effects of that could have been, especially if they scaled out a little bit further, but we tried to make everything as self-service as possible and assume the role of a developer. So 
essentially taking one hat off and putting another hat on as a developer and try and do things without trying to ele elevate your privilege to a platform engineer. Um, but for the most case, we try to make it as self-service as possible.